Hello and welcome. It is barely two days to Christmas with less than 10 days to the new year. And while preparations to celebrate continues to gain momentum, the season also comes with a need to reflect on events that defined Africa in the last 12 months. This is Africa This Week and I'm your guide, Fadishola Shutingwa. We start off the day with earlier in the week. Welcome on board. As the Congo presidential election comes up in less than two weeks, President Joseph Kabila on Monday vowed to stay involved in politics. President Kabila stated this in an interview with journalists. He added that his role is to ensure the Congo does not return to the way it was 22 years ago. And according to the president, this is the, not the end of the journey as he just might contest elections again. Congo is set to go to the polls on December the 23rd, and that's tomorrow. My role will be to make sure that we, we don't go back to square one. Uh, square one meaning where, the, where we found the Congo 20, 22 years ago. Look at my face. Do I look worried? I don't know you. So, see, <laughs> I'm not worried. Uh, we, we've managed to give the best that we could for, for our country. I believe that was in itself uh, a task and a mission. Uh, secondly, do we, have, uh, do we have any any regrets? No, not at all. And on the news on Tuesday, dozens of European Union and African heads of state, foreign ministers and business leaders gathered in Vienna to boost economic ties. They called on Europeans to recognize Africa as a continent of opportunities rather than poverty. Migration was not on the official agenda of the summit, but was discussed on the sidelines. Austria is also trying to revive the EU campaign for North African countries to take in more Mediterranean sea migrants. Still on the news on Tuesday, an ex-president of Madagascar and the man who overthrew him in a 2009 coup were both set to become the island state's next leader in a runoff election on Wednesday. Mark Ravalo Manana got 35% of the vote in the November the 1st round, behind his successor, Andrew Rajolina, who got 39%. The incumbent president, Henry Rajolnari Mampianina, considered defeat in his bid for a second term after managing a distant third. Madagascar, a sprawling island off the coast of southeastern Africa, held its last elections in 2013. The Congolese will still head to the polls on December the 23rd after thousands of voting machines went up in flames last week. The Electoral Commission assured on Tuesday that the incident will not affect the conduct of the vote to elect Joseph Kabila's successor. The introduction of the untested tablet-like voting machines for the election has been widely opposed by opposition candidates. They say the machines are more vulnerable to vote rigging than paper and ink and could be compromised by the unreliability of Congo's power supply. But the Independent National Electoral Commission believes the voting machines will facilitate, speed up and give reliable and truthful results in the long delayed presidential election. What does this machine offer? It offers facility, meaning it facilitates the vote, reliability, because after the vote, the machine will give us two sources of results, even if the results that will determine the winner will be counted manually. Speed, because the period separating the announcement of the result will be shortened, thanks to the fact that the ballot is no longer a large ballot or small ballot that will be separated easily. And finally, truth enfin, we want the winner to win désir. for the best to bring the vote home this machine 
has a right to eliminate any attempt of cheating that we may have had in 2011 and 2016. Last week's blaze at an electoral commission depot destroyed 8,000 voting machines due to be used in the capital Kinshasa. It's unknown who is responsible for the fire, but the ruling coalition and leading opposition candidates have traded blames. Mofeashenko, TVC News. Well, on Wednesday, South Africa issued an arrest warrant for Zimbabwe's former First Lady, Grace Mugabe, over last year's alleged assault in an upmarket district of Johannesburg. And after the alleged assault with an electric cable came to light in August last year, the South African government granted Grace Mugabe diplomatic immunity. That immunity, however, was overturned by a South African court this year after the alleged victim, model Gabriela Engels, challenged the decision. The South African police is seeking Interpol's help to enforce the warrant. There was no immediate comment from Mrs. Mugabe or from authorities in Harare. And still on Wednesday, voters in Madagascar cast their ballots in the presidential runoff election between two former presidents and beta rivals. Andrew Rajolina and Mark Ravalomanana were the top two vote getters in November's first round of voting. Ravalomanana, who voted in the capital, and Tananarivo, expressed confidence of victory while addressing reporters. His rival candidate, Rajo Lena promised to put the past behind him and accept whatever outcome emerges. The European Union, African business leaders and heads of state agreed to future investments of about $1 billion at a forum in Vienna on Wednesday. The EU-Africa forum was hosted by Austria and Rwanda to boost economic ties between both regions. Migration issues were also discussed at the meeting as Austria is trying to revive the EU campaign for North African countries to take in more migrants. The new relationship taking shape between our continents is focused on shared prosperity. Creating more jobs and trade in Africa will support employment and growth in Europe as well. Fully integrating the people of Africa into the global economy presents one of the greatest business opportunities of our time. By recognizing our fundamental interdependence, we will also be able to find humane, orderly, and mutually beneficial solutions to the migration challenges that dominate the headlines today. Reports about the possible delay of the presidential election in the Democratic Republic of Congo were further filled on Thursday after the Electoral Commission, which is the CENI, summoned the candidates to a meeting at the Parliament building. A CENI spokeswoman, Mari France Idikai, invited the candidates to an 11 a.m. meeting, and one of the candidates who attended the meeting said the president of the body told them Sene is not able to organize the vote on time. Idikai later denied media reports that Sene was considering postponing the election by a few days due to delays deploying voting materials to polling stations. The DRC's long-awaited polls have been delayed by two years, but the electoral body says a delay will serve a better purpose than to rush the process. Campaigning has been chaotic in parts of the country, with opposition supporters clashing with law enforcement officers. The main opposition candidate, Martin Fayulu, has also reported campaign trail muzzling by the government. Security forces in Sudan have fired tear gas to quell protests on Thursday after people took to the streets chanting anti-government slogans. A decision to reduce bread subsidies this year sparked rare nationwide protests in Sudan after prices doubled. 
A state of emergency was declared in the Atbara city on Wednesday after hundreds of people demonstrated against price increases and set fire to the local headquarters of the ruling party. Sudanese authorities have now declared a 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. curfew in Atbara, Sudan's railway hub, with a large rail worker population manning various lines, interchanges and maintenance workshops. And it was good news for Africa on Friday after the United Nations General Assembly adopted its first ever resolution addressing poverty eradication in rural areas, underlining the importance of concerted efforts to achieving the 2030 Agenda Goals. The resolution noted that nearly 80% of the extreme poor live in rural areas and rely on agriculture. And the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development makes it a priority to end poverty. The resolution also asked the UN Secretary General to submit a report to the UN General Assembly meeting next year in order to include poverty eradication in rural areas in the agenda. And with that, we have come to the end of earlier in the week. Up next is Dig and Dip, and that will be after the break. Do stay with us. Welcome back to Africa This Week. Now, from key defining moments to incredible political scenarios, 2018 can easily be termed the year of the good, the bad, and the interesting for Africa and the rest of the world. This year, news headlines featured both newcomers and old timers, where people, policy, and power influenced almost all the events that shaped the continent in the last 12 months. This special episode features Africa in retrospect, 2018, with key focus on events between January, February, and March this year. And joining me to dig deep on Africa this week is Cyril Abaku, our assistant editor, assignment and research. Welcome and thank you for joining me. Thank you for that. I'm glad to be here. Now, with the, let's start with a very major event that happened this year, mm -hmm. Liberia. That was um, Monday, January the 22nd. Mm -hmm. Liberia began the year on a very fresh note, and uh, it was following George Ware's inauguration mm -hmm. as president. Mm -hmm. Now, what are your thoughts on how political developments ev has, have evolved in Liberia since he's um, taken up the big position as president? I think it's been fairly stable. It's been what the people bargained for. Mm. Um, because if you if, if you recall, I think it began in Sierra Leone, it came to Nigeria, it got to Ghana, it got mm. to Liberia, across West Africa. We saw cases where governments in power, you know, their parties or the incumbents lost elections to opposition, which normally perhaps would not have happened or, or wouldn't have been expected. And then uh, people in opposition won elections and, uh, you know, um, and became president. Where, um, for many years, had been the unofficial president of the country, you know, because of his large philanthropy, because yeah. of his, his personal charisma and so on. Mm. And so I've been trying to be president for several years, you know, um, finally he made it. And then you saw that, f first of all, um, his inauguration attracted people to Liberia in a way that it had never happened before. And so you can see that, even as president, um, he continues to maintain that goodwill mm. and support. So I think that, um, by and large, in the past, in the past, Eight or nine or so, um, or, or let's say eight, nine, eight, 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 eight or nine months or so, um, he has been. It's not been the smoothest of takeoffs, but I think that he's getting there. Do you think um, Liberia will get to um, any sustainable development stage under him within a short period, or is it going to take a, a long mile? I wouldn't expect a, 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 a short period success. Okay. You know that for I think it was in Nigeria some time ago to ask for teachers or so. Mm. Uh, it, it's not easy. The war did so much damage. And the truth of the matter is that uh, even after the war, um, Ellen Johnson himself, his predecessor, yeah, yes, his predecessor you know, um, all of those people came to power based on certain um, concessions. And so they needed to begin to heal wounds of what had happened. You know, the healing process is one, and then development is another. So I think I and and I for one I do not believe that Ellen Johnson herself brought total healing yet, mm. and so there are a lot of landmines that still need to be taken that uh, on which and so he has to build to tread up very carefully. Yeah. 
And, 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 and then again, the fact is they don't have the manpower. Mm. They don't have the manpower. They don't have the infrastructure. They don't have all the institutions. So he has to begin to build all over again. Mm, that's and it. not minding the fact that, you know, a political process brought him to power. You know that um, Ellen, Ellen Selif was expelled by one party for, for, for supposedly supporting him. Mm. And so because of the political process that brought him to power, and the fact that the country itself is not in a very strong position is going to be a title for him. But I think that gradually, I mean, the fact that the president can travel out and say, I want teachers, can go to the country and say, look, I want help in these areas. Mm. If West Africa, if Africa, if the country is, is, is reaching out to, are willing to offer that assistance, I think that um, he can pull off something big. Uh, what about developing his country and getting the proper manpower in his country? Well, you know, it's not easy. I mean, even in Nigeria, for instance, mm. The kind of capital you need, you require to move certain sectors of the uh, of, of the economy. You need foreign investment, mm. and Liberia. I mean, what 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 do they have? Mining and um, and um, um, what again? You see, the jobs that you, that you need to create, it means that you need to bring in experts into, into the country, and then people who are in Liberia will take up only the mineral aspect, and those mineral jobs cannot bring up a lot of poverty. Indeed. So it's going to take a longer time. All right, so we wish um, Liberia the very best. Let's move on now. January um, 30th, Tuesday, the former Kenyan pres um, presidential candidate, Raila Odinga, mm -hmm. late Raila Odinga now, and held his unofficial inauguration. How can you describe the dynamics that played out after um, that event in Kenya? Well, you know, I mean, for some of us, we were, we were really skeptical um, that um, Raila Odinga really meant what he was doing. Uh, because fundamentally, the opposition became seriously divided, seriously divided after, uh, before and, 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 and after that event. Mm. And then it, it was a mock, it was a mock inauguration. Uh, you know, eventually, eventually, I mean, events after that uh, supposed mock inauguration led to the, the, the National Peace Accords. I, so, so, some of us feel that it was just a way to, to get to an anti-climax, mm. having seen everything that happened in the elections. Some persons said that, well, maybe he knew he, knew he wasn't going to win. And so, in order to dodge the tension, he needed to take a few steps that will eventually lead to a diffusion of the whole uh, situation. Yeah. The mock inauguration gives some of his supporters some, uh, some, some amount of relief because the level of mass action that was supposed to follow the outcome of the elections wasn't seen. What we saw was a supposed mock, in, mock, mock inauguration yeah. that was boycotted by, by his key allies. And so, I mean, it didn't come to anything, really. Mm. Yeah. It was a, a futile um, effort, effort, indeed. Effort, of course. All right. So Wednesday now, on February 14th, um, South Africa, Jacob Zuma, he mm. resigned as president after getting pressure from his party, mm. the African National Congress, um, with um, Cyril Ramaphosa taking his position. Mm. Now, how would you describe Zuma's exit? No, of course, we, I, I have the ANC to thank mm. and uh, Mr. Ramaphosa to thank as well. That they could take that step. African leaders should not get away with corruption, particularly when there are proven cases, when, we, when investigations have been carried out, when there is evidence. Mm. When you let uh, uh, wrong continue to reign, you are, you, are justifying, you are justifying evil and you are, you, you know, you are, you are demonizing good. So I think it was good that the party came together didn't bother to look at again uh, the, the the issues of race and the issues of their their, their party struggle and so on. They have to take him out. We need South Africa, you know, um, now show to the world the fact that look, we fought against apartheid, but merit and anti-corruption and uh, and and probity in government mm. is more important than anything else. And I think that 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 uh, that singular event struck a chord with the world and so i mean i mean uh, um, after it was after you could see foreign investors becoming more confident again in the economy in so i think South it was Africa's a good one. economy yes. Yes, all right was. so wednesday march 21st 44 african countries signed the continental free trade agreement the cfta in rwanda only nigeria didn't sign it what do you make of that one would have thought that the economic diplomacy that the current um, that nigeria has decided to um, to adopt in the past 10 or so years mm. would have resonated with such a free trade agreement because take it or leave it, the, the world economic order yeah. is built on globalization, is built on free trade. But I think Nigeria in the past three or so years has been a bit draggy. You know, even a command economy, even a local command economy, even an, an economy that is planned centrally does not bring miracles overnight. So we are stuck between having the foundations for a liberal economy and having an administration that is perhaps ideologically not so sold to liberalism. 
And so sometimes when these things come up, we are a bit jittery, we are a bit withdrawn from signing these treaties. I think it is because Nigerian businessmen are saying, let's sign this deal and open up this space. We'll create jobs that will be free movement of goods and services. And then look, if indeed we are Africa's leading economy, we'll let us prove it in that space. It's not enough to sit back and say, let's, I mean, they, they, can, they, can, they can leave you behind. Isolationism will not help anybody in the modern time because one way or the other, you will still get involved in trade and then you, 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 you have to pay more mm. when it's external trade. So it doesn't um, help, help us at all. All right. Riley Odinga is in late. Um, the late um, presidential candidate is actually from Zimbabwe. Um, we're going to have to mm. end it here um, on this episode of Africa This Week. I'd like to thank you for joining me, Cyril Abaku, our assistant editor, assignment and research. Thanks thank for you. being here today. My pleasure. Well, it has been an eventful 2018 with uh, so much to reflect on, knowing that in the last 12 months, history was made. Heroes were lost, hope was renewed, and lives were affected in the course of the year. Now, and it's time for lessons of the past to become guidelines for the future and to inspire sustainable development on the continent in the coming year, 2019 and beyond. That's our program for today, and I have been your guide, Fadisha Lashotingwa. Many thanks for watching, and bye for now.